The U.S. Naval Radio Station T. Jim Creek is nestled in the western foothills of the Cascade Range near Arlington, Washington. This location was selected for the generator in 1946 due to its compatible ground conductivity for the ground net, access to substantial power resources via the Bonneville Power Administration, and sufficient height, span, and area for the antenna cable array. Of this nearly 5,000 acre site, only 11 acres comprise the administrative area. This is where the generator building is located, along with the water tank, chlorinator building, and communication control link. Another 928 acres includes the antenna field, support towers, and transmitter building. My name is Lloyd Palmer. I work at uh, Jim Creek Naval Radio Station. Uh, right here you're seeing a uh, sand table diorama thing of the entire base. When you go down here, we are currently located down here in the main building at MWR. The majority of the buildings are, have been destroyed and razzed over the years, but this used to be a functional base of 250 sailors at peak was in like 1960. Now it's ran by mostly uh, Department of Defense civilian employees and Navy personnel. I currently work at the transmitter building, which is way up in the valley. As you can see, way up to the uh, top here where all the wires, which is the antennas, crisscross the valley. The uh, original Jim Creek was building was, uh, this was started in 1948, completed in 1952 by RCA. So you look through here and you see all the bases, there were numerous buildings. You had housing areas all through here in old quarters, as you can see. And then you had the headquarters building and mess hall and uh, dining facilities, barber shops, and an uh, enlisted club on the base. And down below was the engineers that maintained the base roads and facilities themselves. The transmitter building, building one, is way up in the valley. And if you notice underneath the uh, wires here, the antenna system, there are two arrays. There's a west array and an east array. There's actually two antennas that we transmit off of. We can be uh, capable of transmitting up to one million watts off this antenna. We transmit all the way to Australia and underneath the polar ice cap at the North Pole. Jim Creek has been responsible for ship-to-shore communications since the site began running in 1953. Their technology allows them to communicate with submerged submarines by using very low frequencies, VLF, to reach past the surface of the ocean. The U.S. submarine fleet has proven to be an effective deterrent to foreign threats, so as you can imagine, a reliable power source to ensure reliable communication is essential. This is where the Worthington generator came in. The Worthington generator was constructed off-site at the Worthington Corporation facility in Buffalo, New York. It was officially acquired by the U.S. Navy in 1952 at a cost of $1,006,897. It was then transported over 2,600 miles to the Jim Creek site. Following installation, testing, final acceptance, and activation in 1956, the generator came online in 1957. The Worthington generator has successfully served as the primary backup for the Jim Creek Station for 62 years, or approximately 543,120 hours, pending its scheduled retirement in early 2019. It has performed a critical role, ensuring that the facility remained operating without interruption. The generator will be retired and replaced in 2019, now that it has passed its work-life expectancy and its performance and technology are outdated. With such intricate and advanced technology came precise processes and complex machinery. One of these important processes is the starting of the generator. 
Before starting the engine, all 16 of the blowdown valves and the start air valve will be opened. The engine will then be rolled over and all excess fluids will be blown out of the cylinders. At this point, all 16 blowdown valves are reclosed. The first step to starting the engine is to turn on the crankcase ventilation. Once the crankcase ventilation has been turned on, the operating lever will be placed into the start position. Air will then be injected into all 16 cylinders. Once the engine begins to fire, the lever will be dropped to the run position. And speed will be gradually increased on the electrohydraulic governor actuator until 450 RPMs is reached. As you can see, the generator had many complex parts working together elaborately to produce the essential power source needed for the Jim Creek site. Three main pieces of the equipment include the radiator, diesel engine, and generator. Let's explore some of the main equipment seen in the generator room. The control lever mechanism is this entire setup, including a manual throttle lever and synchronized engine governor. This equipment is used in the starting and stopping process of the generator. Some components of the control lever mechanism include governor, governor lever, cam follower, cam, lock, hand lever, control casing, stop, and run. This is the prime mover control panel. Some of the main controls include the speed gauge, crankcase vacuum switch, and each individual section, which monitors lube oil pressure, temperature, fuel oil pressure, and the jacket water pressures and temperatures. When certain parameters are exceeded, the control panel has an enunciator horn that will alert to any abnormal condition. This equipment is the actual generator itself. The movement of this equipment is what generates the electricity. The crankshaft is a single piece forged unit with a flanged dry vent for coupling the shaft to the extension shaft. Some of the parts associated with this piece of equipment include the number one cylinder crank, thrust bearing, crank pin, crankshaft gear, crankshaft, base, flywheel end, and crankcase access ports. The head of the unit is located on the second level of the generator equipment, accessible by ladder. This is where the piston chambers and camshaft are located. This is the generator and exciter panel. This is how the generator is actually placed online. There's two different ways it can be placed online. It can either be closed to a dead bus meaning there's no grid power coming onto the base. To do so, this breaker would be closed, this rheostat would be brought up to 4200 volts, and then this breaker would be closed. This is the actual generator circuit breaker. To parallel this generator to the grid, this breaker would be closed. We would match grid voltage, place this switch to the synchronized mode, there is a synchroscope right here where we can raise or lower the frequency of the generator using this knob right here. We would raise the frequency until that needle is going slowly in the fast direction and then close this breaker, which is the generator circuit breaker, once the generator comes into phase at the top dead center position. This is the lube oil cooling water tower. 
jacket water cooling tower, and diesel day tank, which gravity feeds diesel down to the attached fuel oil pump and then into the injectors of the diesel. The engine exhaust duct is used to guide exhaust gases away from the controlled combustions inside the engine. Before being released, the exhaust gas first flows through the cylinder head, exhaust manifold, and a turbocharger to increase engine power. If we took this entire arrangement of equipment and cut it in half, you would see some of the inner workings of the system. Some of this inner equipment includes air intake, exhaust valve, fulcrum bracket lever, inlet valve, pushrod, cylinder head, piston, connecting rod, camshaft, crank pin, water outlet, exhaust, air inlet, cylinder liner, rubber rings, water inlet, frame, relief cover, and base. If we continue downstairs, you'll find the lube oil sump for the engine, the lube oil circ pump, and the lube oil prelude pump which keeps oil circulating through the engine 24-7 when not in use. In another room of the generator building, you'll find more equipment, including the young radiator unit. The radiator consists of a motor, a right-angle gearbox, a fan, and intake louvers. Here we have the lube oil cooling water heat exchanger. Its primary purpose is to cool down the oil by transferring the oil's heat to the cool water through proximity. This ensures the oil temperature stays within its ideal operating range. These tanks are storage tanks for starting air for the diesel. Finally, we have some spare parts, including the valve seats, spare cylinder sleeve, and spare head unit. In order to stop the generator, the engine is brought to an idle speed on the electro-hydraulic governor actuator by lowering the dial. The control handle lever is then dropped from run to stop. Once the engine comes to a complete stop, all 16-cylinder blowdown valves are reopened and the start air valves are shut.
the Worthington diesel engine generator scheduled removal, it will be replaced with a newer, more efficient generator. The replacement equipment will include two new standby rated diesel engine generator sets that each produce 2.5 megawatts of power at full load. The maximum speed of the new generator is 1800 RPM, which is a huge improvement in comparison to the old generator's maximum speed of 450 RPM. Each of the new engines are manufactured by Caterpillar and our Model 3516C four-stroke cycle, turbocharged and aftercooled with Tier 4 compliance unit. Each of the 16 cylinders arranged in a V configuration has a 6.7 inch bore and an 8.5 inch stroke with a compression ratio of 14 to 1. The replacement of this generator will improve efficiency in operations and will ensure that the Jim Creek U.S. Naval Radio Station maintain the station's mission and effectiveness.